you have Googled yourself at some point or another. Admit it. There's nothing shameful about it. It's not worse than what I did. I searched my name on the dark web. Don't ever make that same mistake. I was 19 years old then. Liv, my girlfriend, and her family were kind enough to let me live in their guest bedroom at the start of that year. They liked the fact that I could fix most of their computer problems. Liv was a great person, and what she saw in a hacker who could never survive for long in the 9-to-5 world is beyond me. Their house was in a suburb only a few blocks away from a library and coffee shops with free Wi-Fi. These locations were convenient for my burgeoning career as a digital outlaw. I used these resources until I was able to move out and get a small apartment of my own. After a string of demeaning jobs and abusive bosses, I found financial independence. I did this after I learned how to buy and sell things I shouldn't have with the use of my Tor browser. I engaged in illegal transactions such as ordering counterfeit money and stolen IDs. I discovered there was a large market for manufactured psychedelics. I often went to the skate park to sell those items off the nethermost landscape of the World Wide Web. Business was good. A young man with years spent in foster care, I sought out activities which gave me a sense of control. A childhood of not having any will do that to you. The ability to navigate the online world to get almost whatever I wanted afforded me a sense of power. It was all going well until one evening in July. I sat on the second level of a Barnes & Noble bookstore in a corner next to the self-help section. I always did my best work there. The place was starting to go under and I did not have to worry about an influx of patrons. Despite having a disguised IP address, I never wanted to risk a raid at home. The items were always shipped to a PO box instead of my unit number as well. In retrospect, these were all flimsy safety measures. They still give me a sense of comfort even if they were a tad delusional. I made sure there were not any cameras mounted near where I sat. It was a small space out of the way of the general public. Hiding in plain sight was always my preferred method. I drank strong coffee out of an oversized styrofoam cup. After 15 minutes of searching, I grew bored. I typed in my name, Joshua Wells. An input of my identity on that part of the web should be an indicator of how successful and arrogant I had become. I did not expect Wikipedia to be among the results, but it was the third link down. The first one involved a ghost tour in New Jersey. The guide had a similar name. The second was a gore website I was not interested in. While I may have been a thrill seeker, I was not out to consume media which capitalized on hurting others. I clicked on the third article link because of the title. It was about a television show. It read, The Short Life of Joshua Wells. At first, the title did not startle me since there are plenty of others with the same name. Recaps of 10 episodes were on the page. The first paragraph illustrated how the series did not continue past season 1. I read the summary of the first episode for the sake of passing time. Episode 1. Joshua's father is a known and feared gang member. His mother is a helpless addict. She attempts to use their own son as a drug mule on a plane flight from Boston to California. She has hopes of making a profit by dealing narcotics to a major crime enterprise on landing. The authorities intercept them. Their son goes with CPS. He goes to a safe harbor for kids. The synopsis struck me as very close to home. Who wrote or directed the show was not listed, but it did state the air date. The month and year given matched the era when an identical set of circumstances had befallen me. The name of the center I went to was even called Safe Harbor. I was too young to remember much, but the facts were precise. I gulped and tried to shrug it off as an unusual coincidence. I read the second episode summary. Episode 2 We follow Joshua on his 15th birthday. He goes to a juvenile detention facility for the first time after he attacks a teacher by throwing a desk at him. Although he missed, the instructor still presses charges since he did not like the student much. He befriends a troublemaker on the inside named Ian. They escape, but not before a massive brawl with the other teens ensue inside of the facility. It ends with the two captured. I felt the hairs on my arm stand up. It was uncanny to me how similar the events were to my own experiences. A slight dizziness overtook me, but I went on to the third, unable to keep my eyes from skimming. Episode 3 Joshua is Free Joshua decides to break and enter an old man's upper class home after scouting the place for days. His goal is to take the many Rolex watches from the top drawer of the old man's dresser. When he enters the house, Joshua discovers how the owner did not take his vacation cruise trip as planned. 
The man was asleep in his bedroom until Joshua wakes the victim by accident. Joshua runs away. He gets chased by the homeowner outside, where the elderly man dies of a heart attack in the street. I felt my chest tighten. It was all true, but I had never shared that story with anyone before. It was one of my most guilt-ridden memories. I read the next two. Episode 4. Joshua has nightmares of the old man crawling out of a ditch and choking him to death. He complains about night terrors to one of his counselors who recommended a doctor. He ends up selling anti-anxiety pills after he does not like the way they make him feel. A girl he asks out overdoses and goes to the hospital. While she survives, he feels terrible but not enough to stop dealing. He takes his earnings and buys a PC. He takes lessons on how to breach other people's privacy from a group of credit card thieves he met in a mall. Episode 5, Joshua discovers the dark web. He uses it to hustle low-level street drugs at first. He later reads headlines about some of his accomplices getting arrested. He still continues to engage in illicit activity. I looked at the air date for episode 6. It was the 24-hour period I was living through. Episode 6. Joshua goes into a bookstore to poach their internet and try to make some money. He does not realize there is a man with a shaved head and a Carhartt t-shirt below him perusing the sci-fi aisle. The stranger is actually an undercover FBI agent. The government worker has a microphone and camera attached beneath his shirt. He is surveying for the perpetrator, even though he is not singled out who he is looking for yet. An arrest commences where they tackle, punch, and taser Joshua. They place him in handcuffs. My hands shook. I stood, gripped an Eckhart Tolle volume to appear less conspicuous, and opened it. I leaned my head over the railing to stare at the ground floor below me. A man who matched the description given by the article was there. His shirt was baggy and hid what I knew to be a gun on his hip. He held a paperback in his hands. I pulled out my phone. I pretended to have a conversation with an imaginary business associate about stocks. I folded the laptop with my free hand and went down the escalator. I strolled towards the back where there were stacks of hardcover tomes on history. I found an unsecured door and walked through it. I was in the warehouse. Unopened boxes were stacked all around. I did not spot any workers and made a run for a rear entrance. I sprinted down a wide alleyway between the building and rows of motels. I passed an art gallery and liquor store before my heartbeat slowed. Along the way, I found a closed vegan restaurant called Balinti's Eatery. The place was black on the inside, but its neon sign still glowed. A picnic table set on the lawn out front. I stationed myself there. I opened the laptop again and connected to their free Wi-Fi without issue. I scanned the rest of the chronology. The remaining episodes were all future time periods. I wiped perspiration away from my forehead as I read the rundown of the next episode. Episode 7. Label the dark net market operator in the media. Three of the seven charges thrown at him lead to convictions. This includes conspiracy to traffic narcotics. He gets out early after he agrees to cooperate with different agencies. He becomes a consultant for cybersecurity awareness and a social engineering expert. Following a keynote speech given out of town, he comes home. His girlfriend, Olivia, and her family have been murdered. My eyes strained and I felt my breath grow shallower. Episode 8. Joshua navigates her house. The walls had dried blood. Every corner is vandalized. Olivia's throat is slit. Her body is over the couch in the living area. Her parents had socks stuffed in their mouths and deep stab wounds on their stomachs. Joshua calls the police. He's treated as the number one suspect in the media for days on end. He is finally cleared, but the psychological damage is too much to bear. I pondered the words. Though I was still young, it is true that Liv meant everything to me. Episode 9. Joshua goes to a psychiatric ward. He stares at the padded walls as though they will converse with him. Detectives do visit him with the hopes of gleaning some kind of further information. They tell him they know the aftermath of the massacre he stumbled upon was the work of an active serial killer. The murderer has remained unidentified. Episode 10. Joshua leaps out the window. He breaks his ankle. An adrenaline dump allows him to move across the field and onto the nearest highway. He goes out into traffic. A long-haul truck careens around him and takes out a line of vehicles. He goes to the nearest lake where he weighs his own pockets down with stones. He waits until nightfall and walks out into the abyss. The last image we see is his hand breaking the surface of the water. 
Starlight glints on his skin before his fingers submerge below the surface. His last few swallows of water create pockets of bubbles which rise to the top. I absorb what the rest of my existence would look like. Four black SUVs pull up and circle around me in the parking lot. Men in black suits and the undercover agent from the bookstore ran at me. Even though I did not resist, they still threw me to the ground. They dislocated my shoulder and kicked me in the jaw a handful of times before they cuffed me. I did get time reduced in prison after I agreed to cooperate to catch people like me. After my release date, I have tried to revisit that link without luck. I fail to understand how the article existed in the first place. I have read how high-level stress can open up insights and portals into the unknown. I would bank on the latter, though. Sometimes I think it isn't for me to know. I do not want to give into what destiny has written for me. My escape from the bookstore has given me confidence that I can change the outcome of the Dark Web's prophecy. If only even for a little while. Or did I only extend the inevitable for a fraction of time? Fate, especially in regards to our stories as individuals, is not written in stone. It is malleable, I tell myself. This positive thought is the only thing which keeps me going. I should visit Liv's house now. She hasn't answered my texts all morning. Ever had a friend that was always tons of fun to be around in high school, but deep down inside you knew they would need to straighten up when they got out into the real world? For me, that friend was Blake. Blake was a country boy like me, raised on the wrong side of the tracks, but always had a smile on his face. He knew how to make people laugh and always had a trick up his sleeve. He was a troublemaker for sure, and as I grew up, I began to realize that despite the fact that I found his company enjoyable, I didn't see us staying friends once I was grown and married and with kids. When we graduated, we promised to stay in touch, but never followed through. Years went past, even a 10-year reunion, and we never really hung out again. Then, out of the blue one day, I got a letter in the mail from Blake. I don't even know how he had my address. It changed a few times since then. It genuinely surprised me to hear from him after all this time. And what the letter said also made me think that he had finally changed his ways. Joey, I think it's time you and I went and had a trip together. We always talked about fishing and hunting on your grandparents' land when we were kids, but never followed through with that conversation. Listen, I want to be real with you. The doctors have given me a short time on this earth, and I want to make the most of it. Me and my old lady are going to gather our hunting gear and make that trip we always talked about. Do you want to join or what? The letter read. My wife didn't have any objections. It's the least you can do given his health situation, she told me. I honestly knew I would feel guilty for the rest of my life if I had said no. The letter came with a phone number, so I texted Blake and we made arrangements that next weekend. I was nervous, wondering if I had made the right choice especially when we finally met near a truck stop on the outside of town. He had a Ford F-150, all filled with camping and hunting gear, and wore camouflage from head to toe. His wife seemed excited for the trip. In fact, despite the circumstances, Blake was grinning from ear to ear. He had shaved his head, probably from chemotherapy, and hopped out of the truck to give me a big hug. You see that, Gracie? I knew Joy would show up, he said. His strength hid the sickness he was battling. He asked why my wife couldn't show, and I explained she had work to cover a double shift for her. She simply asked that we bag a few deer and turn them into chili, I told him. I was glad that there didn't seem to be any bad feelings between us, despite how long it had been since we talked. It felt like time had never really gone forward, and we were still two goofy kids again. I know that sounds good. Blake isn't much of a hunter, but we will get something done. I don't want this trip to be a complete waste of time, his wife said as we unloaded his truck. Well, it's a good thing we are hunting deer, Blake commented as we started into the woods. I asked him what our prey was instead, but he simply winked and told me it would be a surprise. Definitely glad you came for the trip, Joey, he told me as we started our hike. We went deep into the forest, Gracie and Blake hardly saying a word to each other for about an hour. It began to rain, making it difficult for us to be able to find any game trail, so we took a break beneath a canopy of trees. Well, this puts a kink in the plans, Blake commented. What exactly is the plan? We are pretty far out here, bud. Are you going to let me know what the surprise is? I asked, trying to temper my frustration. 
Sure, I guess this is fine, he said calmly. I was looking toward the next area, trying to see if the storm was going to pass when I heard a loud boom. I dropped and covered my ears, turning to see that Blake had just shot his wife in the head. Her entire face was blown off, and I knew the death was swift and painless, but the shock and horror of what he had just done made me want to scream. I barely have a few weeks left, Joey. This is what I've been planning for quite a while, and I brought you to do something else, he said as he kicked his wife's corpse out of the way, and then he passed me his gun, which still had one shot left in it. I don't want to go to weeks of chemo or waste my money on treatment that won't change a thing, and I don't want to suffer. This is my final wish, he told me. The implications of what he was saying and what he had just done. I looked at the gun and at the corpse, my mouth dry. I wanted to run. I could. I knew that since he was sick, he wouldn't be able to catch up with me. But for some reason, I thought maybe I could reason with him. Blake, you just killed your wife. Why did you do that? I asked. I was trying to not sound scared, trying to figure out why he had suddenly become a cold-blooded killer. It's true, she's the love of my life, but I can't imagine her going on without me. And that's why I had to end her life. She ain't gonna enjoy her life without me, Blake said. He had a wild look in his eyes. But despite that, his anger and frustration over what he was experiencing made a certain amount of sense. I could empathize, but there was one thing that still bothered me. Why did you choose me? If I do this, I'll probably wind up in jail. Why are you punishing me with this? I asked. Blake actually laughed. I know you think I'm a loser. You always have. It's true. I messed up a lot of times, but you were always such a goody-goody. And now it's time to make you pay. Because a lot of times when I got in trouble, you were right there with me and never got a single lick. The teachers, the parents, they always thought you were just another victim, he snarled. And if I refuse, have you thought that through? I could go report this to the police right now, I told them. You could, but I thought this through. I could kill you too, and then just die out here in the woods, he said with a shrug. I'm the one with the gun, I told him. Then he took off his camouflage and showed that he had an explosive device around his waist. You can shoot me anywhere besides the head and it will cause the thing to go off. Or I could tackle you and end us both in a blaze of glory, Blake snapped back. I was sweating despite the cold temperature and I wanted to run like I first thought. But I knew if I did that, he might try to set off the explosive and kill me anyway. I was trapped here in the middle of nowhere with a madman. Blake, I don't want to do this, I said my anxiety increasing as I looked at the gun and pointed it at him. You know you've always hated me, Joey. This is your darkest fantasy come true. This is where everything finally can come to a head, he shouted. I was ready to fire. Then I heard a noise from the left. Two hunters came out of the woods, looking at us in confusion and surprise. Blake thought that he could act quickly to scare them away with a bomb vest, but I had other plans. I pointed the gun toward the first hunter and shot him in the foot. He fell to the ground, and in response, the second hunter fired at me in self-defense, and I jumped out of the way. It hit Blake dead in the shoulder. He fell to the ground, ready to use the bomb to kill all of us. I shouted for the hunters to run, and in that short moment of time, I had the chance to jump away toward the hunter I had injured. His explosive caused body parts to fly in every direction. Blood rained from the sky as I covered my face. When it was all said and done, nothing was left of him but a smoldering crater. I told the hunters to turn me in as we made it back to the main trail. They testified about what they knew, and I managed to keep myself from going to jail thanks to them realizing I was the one being held against my will. Blake was once my friend, or so I thought. Now he's gone, and I can't help but to feel his last act was just to cause more trouble. Our town is pretty small. So tiny that we don't even have a Walmart or even a four-way stoplight, but it's still ours and we treasure it for what it is. Been here my whole life, and the only thing that's really grown is the local cemetery. Paradise Fields, they call it. I guess if I wanted to spend eternity somewhere, it would be with a catchy name like that, huh? Anyway, the graveyard was pretty packed even back when I was a kid, 
so much so that there was hardly any room when we buried my papa. I remember someone saying it was a good thing he broke his back so they could fold him up and fit him into the ground. Anyway, a few years after that, I started hanging with the wrong crowd. Wanting to be cool and fit in, I wound up getting the paddle from the principal's office more times than I can count. But no matter what I did, it was still nearly impossible to impress this one group of boys. James, Greg, and Todd, or the Three Musketeers, as they like to call themselves. There used to be four of them, but Rob had left the group a while back. I would always see them skipping class and running off to buy smokes from the corner store and be jealous, wishing I could be just as brave as them. I didn't really know about it at the time, but Greg's daddy was screwing his teacher, and Greg knew about it, so he hung it over her head. We can do whatever we want or it's your job, Greg would tell her. He was a bit of a prick, but I was young and dumb and wanted to be like them, so of course, I would find ways to skip class too and meet them there. Hey guys, I said nervously that first day when I just hid in the gym after breakfast. Todd laughed immediately when he saw how red my face was. Look at you, just like my dad's ripe tomatoes. What a pussy. Did you run all the way here? He asked. Todd could be cruel, but I was supposed to take the jab and prove my worth, so I nodded and said, I didn't even bother going to the first period. What's your name, kid? James asked. Steven, I said. Tell you what, Steve, you really want to hang out with us? You gotta prove that you're brave, he said. I think it looked like he had a sparkle in his eye. Come on over to Paradise Falls tonight after curfew. If you can get there and finish our challenge, we will be your friend for life, James told me. How will I sneak past my mom? I asked. That ain't our problem. Be there by 8.30 or the deal is off, James decided. I told him I would, and as it turned out, getting out of the house was the easiest part of the night. My mom wound up having to work a double shift, so only my sister was watching me. I told her I would give her 20 bucks if she didn't say that I went out. Where are you headed anyway? She asked when I passed her the money. Just gonna go smoke some weed at the cemetery, I lied as I grabbed a coat. Racing across town in the middle of the night was exhilarating. Only a few street lights were on, and the graveyard felt like it was ecletic and full of spirits when I arrived. The way the moon cast its light down on the tombstones, there were just so many. I got there just barely after 8 o'clock, and I thought for sure the trio had ditched me. Instead, they emerged from behind one of the larger mosques, probably built pre-Civil War, and James whistled softly when he saw me. Wow, Steph, didn't think you had it in ya, he commented. I made it with time to spare, so what are we doing here? James gave his colleagues this wicked grin. Us? We're here to see if you're up to snuff and can fit in with us. So we've prepared a series of three challenges for you to do. If you can do all three before time is up, guess what? You will be in with the gang for good. Okay, sure, I can do that. I wanted to sound confident. James just laughed. I'll go first then, Todd decided as he pointed towards the headstones. You know how this cemetery is pretty big but has tons of graves in it? Well, tonight, those graves are the safe zone and the ground is like lava. You've got five minutes to jump from here to the end of the plot without touching the ground, he decided. The trio laughed and raced off to the other side of the tombstones, leaving me in the dust. Once out of range, they called out to me and the game began. I stood on the edge of the mausoleum, trying to figure out which way to go across the graves. Then I began to hop. As I did, I will admit that I said a prayer to Jesus and asked for forgiveness. I remember when Papa died. I had actually danced on another grave, and Mom warned me to never disrespect the spirits. You'll pay for it if you do, either in this life or the next, she told me. As I jumped toward the next headstone and part of the old relic crumbled, I couldn't help but reflect on her words. What if she was right and I was really awakening a curse by playing this silly game? Then I heard the trio holler excitedly as I nearly tumbled on the grass and my resolve to win got stronger. I had to prove I could be the best, so I kept going. I made it to the other side in about four minutes, leaping from the last headstone and even managing to do a backflip to where they were standing. Whoa, that was pretty cool, Todd admitted. The other two didn't seem very happy that I had passed. I should have wondered if they ever really intended for me to get through to begin with. Beginner's luck. That one was easy anyway. Anyone could pass it, Greg said as he took off his backpack. 
He unzipped the pouch and showed me three small trinkets he'd brought with him before explaining. I'm going to make sure you don't pass this one, twerp. He rushed off to the graves as James passed me a scarf and ordered, Put this on so you can't peek. I obediently listened and stood there waiting as they chuckled and finished their game, coming back about ten minutes later and telling me to pull the scarf off. All right, Stephanie, I hid all three of those items somewhere in the graves. Find them in three minutes and you make it. <laughs> like you ever will, Greg laughed. It's Steven, I corrected, not even realizing they were bullying me about my name. James shoved me toward the graves and put a timer on. I scrambled about looking for any clues that might help. I knew Greg wouldn't have made it easy, but the obvious signs like grass being pressed down by their footsteps made it easy to find the first, nestled in a bush behind a large tombstone. I followed the same clues to find the others, excitedly racing back to them with the trinkets in hand. All three of them were angry now, and I didn't understand why. All of this was just prep for the last challenge. No one has ever passed this. If you do, you'll be legendary, James decided. He led me out toward part of the graveyard that had a little fewer headstones. I recognized the area because this was where Papa was buried. Then James pointed toward an open hole. I peered down and saw a wooden coffin sitting in the dirt hole, probably in preparation for an upcoming funeral. And immediately, I felt dizzy even before James explained what the challenge was. Get in there and we'll bury you. If you can beat the record of six minutes underground, you will be in our club for life. James explained. You... you want me to get in there? I asked, looking down at the cramped space. Well, we could call the whole thing off if you want, he said, kicking some gravel. No, I said quickly, too desperate for acceptance to even think clearly. I climbed in the hole before another word was said. I'll show you. I will make it to ten minutes, I said excitedly. The boys shared a wicked look with one another and ordered me to lay down against the ground. I did as I was told, waiting as they placed the cover on the coffin. Then I heard the shovels and the dirt being piled on. I closed my eyes and tried to not panic. I could do this. My whole body shook and I lay as still as I could. Eventually, it got quiet, so quiet that I shouted and asked if they were done, but I didn't get a response. I waited another minute or so, trying to think if I had passed the record, but I was also starting to feel lightheaded. The oxygen in the wooden box was limited. I started to bang on the cover louder, yelling that I was ready to get out. I never knew what it was like to be claustrophobic until then, but they didn't respond. More time passed by. I was certain that it had been at least 20 minutes. The coffin felt cold and so very dark. I hadn't noticed how dark it was at first. I had tried to ignore it. Now, it was all that I saw. The space felt so confined, and I kept screaming, trying to stay awake. My body was shaking. I could feel myself struggling to take breaths. Finally, I became close to blacking out, and I felt the air escape my lungs. I was sure I was going to die. The next thing I knew, I was in my mom's arms. I was so numb to the entire world that I couldn't remember anything. She took me home and got me some warm soup explaining that my sister had said I had gone out there with some friends. What the hell were you thinking, Steven? I heard that about a dozen times, and I hardly got any sleep that night. It just kept feeling like the moment I fell asleep, I would be trapped again. In fact, I had trouble for years after that too, scratching at my mattress or waking with cold sweats. Terrible nightmares of that cemetery. Of course, the next day I confronted them about it. What? Cemetery? You must be crazy. We would never go out there, Todd remarked. Yeah, and not for some stupid games. You are a psycho, Greg agreed. Their wicked grins told me what I needed to know. They had left me there to die. I still have those same awful nightmares, and I worry one day when I die, I will be trapped in that place forever. My whole family got lost in the woods one time all because my husband decided to stop and take pictures of some bird. We pulled over in the middle of the Shasta Trinity Forest practically, and he grabbed his camera and ran into the woods. At first, I didn't bother to ask where he was going, and told the kids to entertain themselves as he was busy taking pictures of the landscape. I was just glad he was enjoying himself, really. Normally, when I make these trips, it's by myself, and it's strictly business. 
This time, though, I had an extra week available, and he insisted on coming and arranged for the whole time off to coordinate with me. It was summer, too, so of course the kids were going to enjoy it. Matt and Brandon have always enjoyed the great outdoors. Anyway, I waited for about 20 minutes before deciding that he was taking too long and tried to call him. We had started our trip late, so of course it was getting dark quickly, and I didn't want it difficult for him to find the car. I even honked the horn much, but I got no response. The only thing I got was the occasional sound of a wild animal. And I have to admit, sitting there in the car hearing a wolf or coyote howl was a bit unnerving because the sun was nearly gone from the sky. Finally, I decided enough was enough and got out to go look. I knew I couldn't leave the kids in the car, though, so I got them both out and started in the general direction where he had run off about a half hour earlier, shouting his name hoping for some kind of response. It still amazes me how easily we got lost. The woods there are so thick and disorientation happened probably only about six or seven minutes later. I couldn't find the car, I didn't see the road, and I was starting to feel scared. The light from the sky was almost completely gone, and here I was, wandering around the woods trying to find my husband with two kids under ten. I felt foolish and jittery, wondering what I was supposed to do. Finally, I was about a mile trekking into the bush when I ran into my husband. We got into a heated argument about the stunny pole leaving us for so long, but then he admitted that he had actually gotten lost. His cell phone didn't work and neither did mine, and by this time, it was officially night. Now I have been hiking a lot myself, gone to remote locations, and never really felt scared, but this time, thanks to what my husband told me, I was. He said he was convinced a cougar or maybe a pack of wolves was hunting and stalking him. That's why I also got lost, because I was headed back to the car when I spotted one and I didn't want to have it follow me. Then somehow I got turned around, he told me. As we started walking, hoping to get back to the road, I told myself that he was just being paranoid. But then we heard this loud screaming noise on a ridge somewhere above us. It made my skin crawl. My husband reached for my hand and told me not to run, and reminded me to keep the kids calm. Surprisingly, so far they didn't seem the least bit worried. I think they thought we were just going on a small walk, and so we carefully walked together toward what we thought might be the road. We heard branches breaking behind us, likely a group of the lions getting close, and my husband reminded me again not to run. He said to the animal, a sprint or a run makes them think the hunt is on and we would all be torn to shreds if we attempted anything like that. My heart was pounding, and I was trying not to cry. I was sure that whatever was hunting us would just wait for one of the kids to slip and fall. I mean, the forest around us was in complete darkness by now, and my phone had died. Only my husband's small flashlight guided us. Eventually, we came across what looked like an Airbnb, and thankfully it looked like someone was staying there. Me and the kids stayed on the porch as my husband got their attention. I bet we probably scared this poor young couple senseless. They argued with him for almost 10 minutes about letting us stay for the night, and soon it became clear they weren't going to be courteous. I felt my heart drop as I saw my husband's agitated face and realized we would have to press forward in the woods during the night. The predators were getting closer. They were right at the edge of the tree line watching as we reluctantly walked away from the Airbnb. I wish I could have chewed them out for refusing to help, but I know it wouldn't have done much good especially because our nightmare was about to become far, far worse. The mountain lions were getting closer by the minute. They were no longer frightened and seemed to be circling, deciding when to attack. No matter what happens, you have to keep moving, my husband told me. Matt and Brandon were trying their best to not cry as the lions growled again and started charging. He passed me his cell phone and pushed us toward the next part of the forest where a river ran down a slanted hill. I wanted so badly to stop him from doing something stupid, but I recognized it wasn't going to do any good. He was making a choice, sacrificing his own survival for our own. I know logically what he did was the only way we were going to get out of these woods without getting attacked as well, but that doesn't make it any less horrific what I witnessed. I turned my head to call to him, trying to find a way to save us all, and then I saw the first mountain lion pounce on him, its claws ripping into his chest with ease. It was like seeing scissors shred apart paper. Blood and flesh smeared across the clearing as my boys ran across the stream, and I watched the lions circle my husband. He was surrounded and about to be their meal. 
He shouted for me to run, and I did, as I heard his own screams of death echo through the night. No matter how far we ran, I swear to you, I heard the screams, and the crunching of his bones, and the howling of the predators. My broken mind kept replaying the moment of his death. They tore and broke his arms apart, ripping into his chest cavity with so much ease that it was terrifying to consider they had let us live for so long. But I couldn't stop, so I could cry or mourn his passing. I had to push my boys to keep going, and I was certain the moment we stopped, those lions would find us. Pure adrenaline pushed us out of the woods into the highway at last. It wasn't safety yet, but it was reassuring to be out of the woods. Exhausted, we collapsed on the side of the road, covered in dirt and mud, and probably looking like a bunch of dead people. Inside, I was sure I didn't feel anything except pain. I managed to stay awake until we flagged a patrolling ranger. As it turned out, they had found our car stranded and had already begun a rescue effort. They ultimately found my husband's body, what was left of it. When I looked through his phone for pictures to use at the funeral, I found myself reliving the terror with a simple photo of a bird. The stupid thing that had started it all, I realized. I don't believe I will ever fully recover, and neither will my boys. Dad packed his hunter starter pack, two Snickers bars, a gallon of water, a half gallon of milk, two protein bars, and a handful of Slim Jims. He was dressed in camouflage with his yellow sunglasses, the ones he bought off the TV. I didn't have the kind of gear he did, so I settled on hand-me-downs from Pat, a camo t-shirt, hiking boots, and tan khakis. In a moment of muscle memory, I texted him to make sure it was okay to wear his stuff. It took me halfway through the message to remember he wasn't going to respond. I put my phone in my pocket and followed Dad out the door. We got in his pickup truck and drove toward our destination. I didn't know where the hunting grounds were, but Dad said they weren't far. Outside, the sun was crawling into the sky, turning the black into shades of purple and red. I didn't know why we had to leave so early. Dad never explained it, and I never asked. We just need to get one thing clear today. I, Dad chewed on tobacco as he talked. What is it? I asked. When we have the shot, we can't hesitate, he said. Yeah, sure, I said. Dad took Pat hunting every year, and all I heard was how good of a shot Pat was. Personally, I preferred video games and horror movies to sitting in the mud and killing woodland creatures. Mom and I would prepare the post-hunting feast of ribeyes and baked potatoes, which at least earned me some brownie points from Dad. When we hit the highway, Dad took the exit south towards Pittsburgh, which I thought was odd. I didn't know much about hunting, but I knew there were a lot more deer in the Allegheny Mountains than there were by the stadiums. Do we need to get supplies or something? I asked. Dad picked up an old sheets cup and spit into it. Nope. We ended up in Squirrel Hill just northeast of downtown which had big colonial houses and a boutique movie theater. Mom took me there once to see Booksmart because it wasn't playing at the Cineplex in our town. We ate bunch of crunch and popcorn, our shoulders bumping as we laughed. Dad never went to neighborhoods like this though. He hated yuppies. After a few more minutes of driving, we pulled into a hiking trail parking lot. Ahead of us, I could see a neighborhood through the trees. The trail ran along their backyards. We were the only car on the lot. Dad didn't say anything as he went to the bed and grabbed his rifle. I stayed in the truck, waiting for my orders. When it was time to hunt, Dad knocked on my window. I opened the door and followed him onto the trail. I bet you like how quiet the house has gotten, Dad said. I was walking behind him, carefully dodging the sticks he snapped with his boots. Do I like that the house is quiet? You're an indoor kid, he said, and the house was loud with everyone in it. I loved your mom, but she had opinions almost as big as mine. Pat and I mostly agreed, but he was starting to get a mind of his own. Dad laughed as he spit more tobacco in the mud. Ahead of us, the neighborhood was getting closer. I don't like the quiet, I said. Dad nodded as he slipped the bullet into the rifle. I was surprised how close the neighborhood was to the hunting grounds. When I imagined hunting, I pictured men dudes in tree houses on the side of a mountain, no people in sight. Wouldn't people here be scared by the gunshot? I like quiet when I choose the quiet, Dad said. We didn't choose our quiet, did we? I didn't say anything. Instead, 
I chewed on the inside of my cheek. After a few bites, I could taste blood. I have to live in a quiet house because of another man's decision, Dad went on. Do you know how many times I was drunk in a bar and had the thought of just driving home? I'm not a rich man. I couldn't afford a $20 cab every time I want to buzz, but I called one every time. I knew there were moms and kids out on those roads, and I didn't want their blood on my hands. Dad stopped walking. Is that 411? He asked, pointing to a house. I studied it. In the distance, I could see the mailbox. 411 was written in block letters on the side. I think so, I said. The house was straight out of a James Bond movie. Massive windows. A back deck that was wrapped around the first floor. Greek statues. There was a pool and a waterfall in the backyard. Although it was still early in the morning, there was a kid and a mom out by the water. The boy, probably about preschool age, had a remote in his hand. There was a small boat circling in the water. Dad took a knee and lifted the scope out of his bag. He slid it on the rifle. Have you learned about STDs? Dad was whispering now. He looked through the scope and adjusted it. It took him three times to get it right. His hand was shaking. STDs? I asked. Diseases with crazy names getting passed from person to person, Dad said. You have a fun night with a girl and wake up with a fist-sized lip. You know about those, right? I nodded. I looked back at the woman and kid. She was kneeling down next to him, rubbing his shoulder. She had this big smile on her face, like this kid operating this boat was the greatest thing to ever exist. She reminded me of Mom. You know about that? Dad asked. He was laying on his belly in the mud now. The rifle was pointed to the house with the waterfall pool. Know about what? How diseases can transmit between people. He was getting frustrated. Sure, yeah, why? Pain is like an STD, he said. People give it to each other. If you have a lot of pain in your life, you need to be responsible. Transferring pain to someone is never innocent. Sweat broke out on my forehead. I didn't like the way Dad was talking. It was the same way he talked when he got the news about Mom and Pat. Where are the hunting grounds? I asked. Dad cocked his rifle. The man who owns that house gave us a lot of pain, he said. I looked back through the trees. The pieces were coming together. No, Dad, I said. We need to go home. Did you know that he left the hospital after two hours? What? Mom and Pat are sitting dead in a car, and he's skipping home to his family, Dad said. He only had a couple of bruises. Dad pressed his eye against the scope. We need to redistribute our pain, he said. I never went against my dad. He and I didn't have the best relationship, but there was a silent understanding between us. Stay out of my way, and I'll stay out of yours. But there was nothing to be understood here. Dad took a long, slow breath. As he exhaled, I dropped down and shoved the rifle's barrel into the dirt. Hey! He barked, pushing me back. Let's go home, I said. We don't have a home, he said. Dad turned on his side and kicked me. His foot landed hard into my stomach, sending me back into the mud. Please don't do this, I said. I tried moving closer again, but it hurt too much. When I breathed, I could feel the sharp edge of my rib puncturing something. I took short, wispy inhales like a wounded animal. Dad didn't look at me. He kept his focus on the woman and child. This is for you, baby doll, he whispered. The sound of his rifle echoed through the forest. I closed my eyes and buried my face in the mud. As the ripples of the blast softened, I heard a splash. I lifted my head out of the grass, blade by blade. The remote-controlled boat was still doing circles. The woman was looking into the pool, her eyes as wide as dinner plates. She stood quiet for a moment. When she finally screamed, her eyes didn't change. The only thing that moved was her mouth. It dropped open like a nutcracker's. The sound she made was raw and cavernous. As the boat slowed to a stop, the water under it turned purple, then brown, then red. Dad took his face away from the scope and cried. It wasn't the way he cried at Mom and Pat's funeral. Those were back straight, tough guy cries. These were different. He wept like a kid who didn't get the right toy for Christmas. Then, as if hypnotized, Dad stood up, wiped the dirt off his overalls, 
then walked back toward the car. I watched him walk down the path, his posture caved in. I wanted to run up and grab him, tackle him, punch in those stupid eyes, but I couldn't. When I tried to move, my body didn't respond. The woman's cries echoed closer to me, as if I was the god she was begging to. I wanted to vomit. I didn't know if Dad's pain went away, but mine began to grow. The longest I have ever gone without sleep previous to this experiment is five days. I have been training my body for the past year to withstand conditions most humans wouldn't imagine. I have stayed awake 24 hours while lifting weights for 20 of those hours, then running 5 miles. I would then walk around for 6.5 hours making my total 30 hours. For the next 18 hours, I would continue my life like every day, writing, documenting, talking, walking, working, etc. I have done this experiment successfully 10 times of straining myself for 48 hours. I now have the stamina of, well, I don't know what to call it, but I have it. I regularly don't sleep for 3 days at a time. The longest anyone has stayed awake is 11 days and 25 minutes. It was set by Randy Gardner in 1963. I want to top that. Here I will be documenting what happens as well as a camera that will be reviewed after every 6 days. Why am I doing this, you may ask? Well, me and a friend of mine want to see the effects that lack of sleep have on the human body. I won't have contact with anyone for as long as I can go without falling asleep. I will not use any energy boosters. Wish me luck. Day 1, 12.03 AM. These first 24 hours have been a breeze. No signs of hallucinations, sleep deprivation, loss of cognitive or sensory abilities, and no eye bags. All work done today has been productive and easily completed. Appetite is unaffected. No signs of aggression or change in mood. Day 2, 12.04 AM. Day 2 is a repeat with slight differences of day number 1. No signs of hallucinations, sleep deprivation, loss of cognitive or sensory abilities. I do have eye bags. All work done today has been productive and moderately easy to complete. Appetite is unaffected. No signs of aggression or change in mood. Day 3, 12.01 AM. Today is actually easier than yesterday. No signs of hallucinations, sleep deprivation, loss of cognitive or sensory abilities, and the eye bags aren't as noticeable. All work done today has been very productive and easy to complete. Appetite is unaffected, no signs of aggression or change in mood. Day 4, 12.02 AM. Today has been the worst by far. No signs of hallucinations, signs of early sleep deprivations, no loss of cognitive or sensory abilities. Eye bags are carrying in groceries. All work done today was not productive and moderately difficult to complete. Appetite is unaffected. No signs of aggression. Mood has been declined. Day 5, 12.04 AM. It is worse than yesterday. Some signs of audible and visual hallucinations. Seeing and hearing things that aren't there. Signs of moderate sleep deprivation. Slight loss of sensory abilities. Cognitive functions are normal. You can guess the update on the eye bags. All work done today was unproductive and very difficult to complete. Appetite is unaffected. No signs of aggression. Mood has declined moderately. Tomorrow is uncharted territory for me. Will not be leaving the testing chamber in my basement until the experiment is completed. I have nothing but this computer, a bed, food, and water. Day 6, 1205. It has officially been 144 hours since I slept. Various signs of visual hallucinations, seeing small floating balls, signs of moderate sleep deprivation, slight loss of sensory and cognitive abilities, unable to run exercise for longer than 30 minutes per day without total exhaustion. Small amount of work done today. Very unproductive and extremely difficult to complete. Appetite slightly affected due to sickness of the stomach. Some signs of irritation, no aggression. Mood has declined moderately. Day 7, 12 AM. The creatures have begun to haunt me in the shadows. I can ignore them for now. I have severe sleep deprivation. I have lost my ability to speak and cannot exercise or run. Unable to do any work whatsoever. Appetite affected slightly due to vomiting. Extremely irritated. Some signs of aggression. Mood has declined severely. Day 8, 12.05 AM. 
the monsters have been gone for today. I have severe sleep deprivation. I haven't been able to speak yet. I cannot exercise or run. Appetite moderately affected due to vomiting and inability to digest food. Extremely irritated. Signs of aggression. Mood is non-existent. Day 9, 12.07 AM. The monsters still aren't back, but they are watching. Always watching. I don't want to sleep anymore. I can't speak. I cannot run or exercise. I cannot eat, but I can drink small amounts at a time. I vomited six times today. I don't know if I'm being paranoid, but any noises at all have me wanting to scream. I've been trying to attack the creatures in the walls. I don't think my mood is any better. Day 10, 12.02 AM. The monsters won't come back, and I want them to. I just want to know where they are. Then I can stop them. I can't speak. I can't walk. I can't eat or drink. I have red goo coming from my mouth. I have been hitting the walls all day and now my fists have the red goo coming from them. Day 11, 12.03 AM. I did it. I lasted longer than anyone ever has. The monsters aren't back yet, but they will be soon. They don't know I heard them say it. They will be back. When they are, I will be ready. I have been preparing. I know that if I can't see or hear them, they can't hurt me. I won't tell you because you will tell them. I can't talk, but I can scream. I have been screaming for seven hours. I can't walk or use my legs at all. I can't eat or drink. The goo is coming from my mouth and my hands. My fists don't hurt anymore, and I can hit the walls as much as I want. There are cracks in the white hard things that are in my knuckles. The skin is ripped off and stuck to the walls. 12 days, 1 hour, 34 minutes, and 16 seconds. Hello. I conducted this experiment with a friend of mine a few years ago. They went without sleep for the exact amount of time stated. 12 days, 1 hour, 34 minutes, and 16 seconds. We found them in a bloody mess on the ground. We were unable to save them. I decided that I shouldn't tell their story until I felt it was the right time. They had clawed their eyes out. They were still attached, but hanging out of the sockets. They had ripped their ears off and put inside the canal the stuffing of a pillow provided for them. They had ripped open their stomach and pulled out their intestines. Their heart had been crushed and was found with their hand wrapped around it, gripping it. They had a smile on their face. They had shattered knuckles, 14 broken ribs, and were paralyzed from the waist down. They had written, in blood, the words, no sleep, over and over again, all over the walls. On the floor, they had written a short passage stating, I don't sleep and I see them. You sleep and you don't. Just don't sleep. 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 They had ruptured multiple arteries and were pronounced dead on the scene. The footage was confiscated by the FBI and examined thoroughly before being returned to me. It took me two years to watch it, and then after I got out of the mental hospital, I went into the middle of the woods and burned them. I don't know exactly what happened in that chamber. I saw all of it. I witnessed everything they did. Every single act. And yet I cannot understand the horrors that happened in that room. I don't know what to do. I'm scared of what will happen if I don't sleep, but I can't sleep. No matter what I take or do, nothing is working. I am scared, but I am ready. I am ready to see the monsters that mangled my best friend. So, I am putting myself inside the same chamber. I have the same computer, I have the same supplies, I have the same mindset. I have nothing left to lose. My mom surprised me with what I thought at the time was going to be the best graduation present ever. A trip to a remote cabin up in the mountains for me and three of my friends. She gave a few ground rules. The most obvious was that I couldn't invite any boys from senior year. And of course, not to trash the place, since she paid a hefty security deposit. I gave her the biggest hug and swore on my life that I would have the time of my life. I wish I could take back those words. I called Megan, Brittany, and Amber, my closest friends throughout high school, and we hit the road Friday night. It was a four-hour drive into the mountains to get to the cabin, and Mom had only rented it for two nights, so I wanted to get there and enjoy it to the best of my ability. This place feels so boring, Amber said, as we listened to tunes and cruised 80 miles an hour down the interstate. She was mostly on her phone ignoring the scenery. 
Brittany said she was especially grateful to be on the trip to get her mind off of a bad breakup. Her ex had ended things at graduation, apparently. I know this sounds selfish, but the negative energy she was carrying made it a little less enjoyable for the rest of us. I wanted this trip to be fun for everyone, and I hoped she would drop the topic once we reached the cabin. Megan chose to drive the whole way. She was familiar with this area, claiming she had gone there many times with family and friends. I think she was bragging on purpose, trying to lessen the impact of this gift. I know this makes my friends sound like bad people because I'm complaining. I shouldn't do that because of what happened when we made it to the cabin. My mind is just trying to sort through what my emotions were at the time. And at the time, I was mad that each of them seemed to complain about something. When we pulled up to the cabin, I saw a car parked outside and frowned, wondering if this might be the landlord to unlock it for us. Except it was a man and a woman, and it looked like they were unloading luggage from their trunk. Hey there, I'm Claire, here, here to rent the cabin for the weekend, I said, waving toward the couple. The man put the bags down, sharing my confused look. I think you might have the wrong cabin. We reserved 601 for this weekend, he said. He took out his phone and showed the reservation, and I took out mine as well. They were nearly identical. Looks like someone messed up, Megan scoffed. I held my composure and asked the couple if the cabin was something we could share. Uh, to be honest, not really. It's a two-bedroom. But I mean, we already got the key and everything. Look, maybe you should take it up with the office staff, he said. He gave us directions to where we can inquire about a different cabin. Fine mess your mom got us in, Brittany muttered. I held back another sarcastic remark as we made it to the office. Unfortunately for us, they were closed for the day. Well, that's great. What are we supposed to do, sleep in the car? Amber asked. I suggested we return to the cabin and try to appeal to the couple again. I mean, you don't think there'd be that rude to force us to stay out here, do you? I asked. I also tried to call my mom on the office evening number. The one listed under emergencies, but we were too far up in the mountains and the signal was awful. Megan sighed and drove the car back to the cabin. Brittany said she would try to go ask and jumped out. Five minutes later, we got more bad news. Those two couldn't care less about us. Looks like we sleep under the stars for real, she said. Megan contorted her face in disgust. Uh... I don't think so. I'm going to go give those folks a piece of my mind, she declared. She went to the trunk of the car and took out a tire iron. My eyes widened in alarm. What are you doing? Just making a few veiled threats. Trust me, she said. We all waited as she slammed her fist on the cabin door. The man saw the tire iron and again refused to cooperate, claiming he would call the police the next time we bothered their evening. Megan didn't take no for an answer. She took her foot in the door as he attempted to close it, and then things became extremely heated between the two of them. I asked if we should interfere, and then the unthinkable happened. The man grabbed and twisted the tire iron out of Megan's hand, slamming it across her head. I think I screamed. Her body fell like a ragdoll to the ground as he looked toward our car and shouted a warning before slamming the door again. All of us hurried to Megan's side. She was bleeding profusely, and it looked like part of her skull had caved in. This wasn't just a self-defense. This man had assaulted her. What do we do? The closest hospital is probably hours from here, I frantically said, as blood got everywhere. Brittany looked toward the car and ordered us to carry Megan to the back seat. Once all of us were in the car, Brittany instructed us to buckle up, then she started blaring the horn loud to get the attention of the couple. The wife finally peeled the curtain back and we waved frantically to show what had happened to our friend. About five minutes later, the couple came out both carrying weapons. The man had the tire rod and the wife had what looked like a sawed off rifle. She fired on the front of the car, blowing the tire out. Oh my god! Brittany screamed. Can we drive out of here? I shouted. But before my friend could even make a response, the woman fired again and a bullet ripped through her skull. Brain matter and blood splattered on the front windshield as Amber and I dropped to the floor of the car. 
We've got to get out of here, I said as the couple approached us. Amber climbed to the front of the car and somehow managed to put it in neutral, and the car started to roll toward the couple. They weren't quick enough to jump out of the way, and I heard the back tire strike the woman. Then we hit a tree. Stay down, Claire, Amber told me, as she crawled out of the car toward the injured woman. I peeked out to see the two of them tussling for the firearm. Much to my dismay, it went off in my friend's face. I sank down into the back seat, trying to keep it together as I realized two of my friends were now dead, and Megan was probably about to be gone too. I had no other choice but to push Brittany's corpse out of the way and thrust the car full speed toward the woman. Battering her body down, I screamed in a fury as I hit her. Glass shattered and she yelped as she went flying. Now only the man remained. He was standing there, looking at the grisly scene, holding the tire iron, and waiting for me. You can't really think you can just walk away from this. What we did was self-defense. What you're doing is murder! He snapped at me. The car refused to work, and I got out and stood there, shaking angrily as I looked at my friends. We didn't even hurt you! You attacked us! I screamed. It was our cabin! The man argued. Then he rushed toward me. Somehow I anticipated it, and managed to swipe and push him toward a nearby hill. He tumbled and fell. I heard his bones break as he rolled. Then at last, he hit something that speared him straight through. Immediately I went into the cabin, and used the landline to call emergency services. Megan is still in a coma, and I'm devastated by what happened. Perhaps most frightening of all, is that as the investigation began, They said there was no record of my mom purchasing the reservation for us. The lead detective speculated we were deliberately sent to the cabin. It was a trap. She paid for the other two people, not us. I get sick thinking my mom tried to kill me and I don't know why. But I don't think I want to know either. I moved into my new apartment a few months ago right towards the end of summer. This apartment is very typical, one bedroom, one bathroom, a kitchen which leads into a living room as well. This would be the first time living on my own, but I was confident. I knew when my rent was due, my budget for food, and all that stuff. I was sitting on my bed looking for jobs when I first heard it. I heard my door creak open and then close abruptly. As you could imagine, I was very confused, but a couple of searches throughout my apartment let me calm down. A few minutes later, it happened again, a slow creak and then a sudden slam as the door was shut. This time, I was more annoyed than scared. I went through my apartment one more time and found nothing. After a little thought, this was the explanation I came up with. The door to my bedroom has this broken latch, which is stuck as if someone was constantly holding it open, which means that my doorknob is useless and I can push and pull my door open. As I tend to shut my door often, this means that my bedroom can get pretty hot and the air becomes pretty stale. This means that I have my window open almost 24-7. This means that my door opening and closing is a result of the draft that comes through the window. The wind will push the door then get cut off, letting the weight of the door push it close. This began to happen so often that I didn't even bat an eye to it. A little while after I started my courses, I was up late studying for some of my first exams. It was particularly cold that night, so I went and closed my window. From my position on the bed, I didn't have an immediate sight line on the door, and I would have to lean in forward to get a good view on it. As I was reviewing the material that my professor had posted, I heard that all too familiar slow open and abrupt close. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up and immediately I felt the sensation that I was being watched. I took a weary step towards the door and opened it, staring into the dark void that was my bathroom. I went through my entire apartment and no window was open. In other words, there was no way, no reason for that door to open like it normally did. There was no logical explanation. Unless... No, stuff like that isn't real. I went back to my bed and tried to get back on track with my work, but I couldn't think straight. All I could think of was somebody hiding somewhere in my apartment just watching me. I thought to myself that there was no way I was sleeping in my apartment tonight, 
So I called up a bunch of people from school or anybody in the area to see if anybody had any room for me to sleep. But alas, they had no room for me, as most of them already had three college students in a two-bedroom apartment. Totally pissed off, I looked towards the direction of my room and shuddered. I ended up sleeping on the couch. Nothing happened for a few weeks, and I had almost forgotten about it if it weren't for the door almost constantly drifting open and then slamming over and over. One night at about 2am, I shot awake suddenly. I had no nightmares, no bad dreams nothing. I didn't even feel tired. I was dead awake. I had closed the window before I went to sleep because my apartment is right next to a train station and the noise was unbearable. I had sat there just listening in dead silence. The only noise was the blood pumping through my ears. When I finally lay down, I heard the door creak open. It didn't close. I leaned forwards to get a better view of the door and I screamed. Looking back were two eyes equally bloodshot as if this thing was just crying. Its pupils were as black as the darkness that had surrounded it. I sat there, paralyzed. I saw a hand, which looked like it was manifested from the darkness resting on the door. The skin was wrinkled and hung loose from the bone. Its fingers were long and thin and its nails were like daggers attached to the end of its fingers. It rhythmically tapped its fingers on the wood, still staring. Its eyes were upturned as if it were smiling at me, yet I did not see any mouth. I was beyond horrified. All I could do was watch as it waded into the room, moving awkwardly as if it had just grown these limbs and was just testing them out. He came to a stop at the foot of my bed. It looked as if this figure had been built from wire, elongated beyond proportion. I could see his ribs poking through his skin, begging to be freed from his ribcage. He was almost as tall as my room, easily being over 10 feet tall. He raised his impossibly thin arm and pointed at me. I heard one thing. Leave. I didn't have to be told twice. I bolted out of bed and ran past him towards my front door. It felt as though I ran for 100 meters. It felt like an eternity, that it was impossible to escape and I wasn't moving. But I reached the front door. I swiftly grabbed my keys and sprinted out. Before I left, I took one look back, and the figure seemed to be smiling, staring at me. Run away. I quickly moved out after that, only returning during the day to pack my shit and leave. I found another apartment that was a bit more expensive, but I was happy to pay whatever to get out of that place. A few months after whilst I was working on an English essay, the news station that was on in the background caught my attention. Recently, a landlord at the redacted apartment buildings has been arrested for the murder of six tenants over the course of three years. His most recent victim, Sadie Redfield, was reported missing two months ago, and when Sadie's neighbors reported a foul stench coming from her apartment, room 163, two police officers showed up on the scene and found the landlord cuddling with Sadie's decapitated body. The news showed an image of the landlord in his name, and my blood ran cold as I recognized the man as my own landlord. Just then, there was a knock on my door. I walked up to it, and on the doormat was a box. I looked left and right down the corridor and saw no one. That's weird. First of all, I didn't order anything. Second, there wasn't a delivery guy outside. And third of all, how did someone get away so fast without causing any noise? I picked up the box and attached to it was a small post-it note. See you soon. I opened the box and screamed. Inside the box were a bunch of photos of me sleeping and laying on my bed, all taken from that creaking door. One of the most fascinating events in history by far was a Chernobyl disaster. The nuclear power plant that exploded, killing 31 immediately and thousands after the effects of radiation took their toll, is located between the city of Pripyat and Chernobyl in the Ukraine. The Pripyat River and a large body of water that was used as a cooling reservoir for the power plant run adjacent to these two cities. After 30 years, wildlife is thriving in these now overgrown ghost towns, even better than before the incident occurred. Some residents have returned to the city of Chernobyl to resume their lives, but Pripyat is still completely abandoned. I wanted to know why. I'm a bit of a disaster enthusiast, as morbid as that sounds. One of my favorite hobbies is visiting sites such as Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Three Mile Island, Popol, 
I've toured as close as I can to Fukushima and have seen the Darvasa gas crater or the gates of hell with my own eyes. I've even gone as far as Auschwitz in Poland. There's something humbling about seeing a man-made disaster in person, seeing how destructive and uncontrollable the human race truly is. There was only one place left in my bucket list. I wanted to see where one of, if not the worst, nuclear disaster happened. An explosion so catastrophic that it leaked 100 times the amount of radiation into the air than that of Hiroshima or Nagasaki. I bought my airline tickets and packed my backpack. There was a small layover in France before the next flight took us to the Ukraine capital, Kyiv. I got a hotel room and got some much needed sleep for the adventure ahead. I was able to get a local taxi service to take me right outside of the city of Chernobyl the next day. It was about a 10 kilometer or 6 mile walk to the reactor in the city of Pripyat. I retrieved my backpack from the trunk and began my trek. It was still relatively early in the morning, as long as I kept a steady pace, I could be there by midday. Easier said than done with an enormous backpack slowing you down. What should have been a 2, maybe 3 hour hike escalated into a 5 hour haul. I must have passed the nuclear plant as I was first met by these large white apartment like buildings. Pripyat was home to over 40,000 workers and their families before the nuclear blast forced an emergency evacuation of all its citizens. In the matter of a few days, it was abandoned, never to see another resident. I ventured into the city, taking in the silence and perilous views. It was pure bliss. I passed the infamous Ferris wheel and the remnants of a once lively carnival. Tall buildings paint the perimeter of the city and vehicles lay untouched throughout the streets. Everything has been overtaken by plant life. Nature has truly thrived since humans left this area. Deer, bison, wolves, cows, and birds appear in abundance. Even though these animals are doing well, they are still affected by the radiation and it's best to steer clear of them. I can't stay long, I want to make it to the reactor by nightfall. I make my way to the river that will guide me south to the power plant. As the sun sets and my legs grow tired, a giant concrete dome pierces the horizon. I read that a 500 foot structure was built in the late 2017 to help contain the radioactive waste for the next century or so. This must be it. I made it. I found a small clearing a good distance away from the reactor and set up camp. My life revolved around these activities, but I wasn't stupid. In case the local police or military patrol the area, I wanted to stay fairly hidden. I know I could get in a lot of trouble for trespassing in such a dangerous area. After the tent was set up, I crawled inside and was immediately greeted by sleep. I was awoken by the quiet tap of rain on the tent. I rolled over and closed my eyes to return to sleep, but was met by another sound that made my blood run ice cold. It sounded like something was in distress, something very large. The cry echoed like thunder. It was very guttural and sounded almost like a whale call. The vibrations of the hum shook the tent. Adrenaline coursed through my veins. I unzipped the tent just enough to get an eye through but was met only by the darkness and cold rain. I continued to unzip the door so I could get a better look. Whatever it was, a small plastic tent wasn't going to provide much protection. I grabbed my flashlight and stepped outside. The hum cries out again. Birds frantically flee their nests. Then, like a wrecking ball to a building, an abrupt crash follows, shaking the earth. Construction? In the middle of the night? I ponder out loud. A crack of lightning lights up the entire sky. What I saw that night cannot physically be possible. I've gone through multiple scenarios in my head trying to come up with a reasonable explanation. A creature stood over the cement building that covered the nuclear plant. It was in the shape of a human, but just the decayed skeleton of one. The building was 500 feet tall. That's about 166 yards. This thing lingered over it, slamming its closed, rotted fists into it. Its jaw slowly cracks open as another booming hum rattles the trees. My attention is diverted to something stirring in the cooling reservoir. The sounds of a submarine breaching water? I wait for another flash of lightning so I can see through the thick black of night. I'm splashed by water as an arm, stories tall, reaches into the sky and slams on the ground outside the reservoir. Another creature emerges from the water's depths, this one screaming an ear-piercing howl like that of a banshee. Much different than the other one. 
I rip my gaze away from the beast, grasp my flashlight, and run for the protection of the tree line. When I penetrate the forest, I'm met by a forceful push. I'm tackled to the ground as Russian men in military outfits scream at me. It's pouring rain at this point. I try to explain I can't understand them, but before I can even move my mouth, the cold butt of a rifle strikes my face and I lose consciousness. When I came back around, I was on an airplane. I rubbed my forehead where the rifle was struck, but nothing was there. Just the faint remnants of a headache. The plane landed in France, and as my backpack came down the conveyor belt, I noticed something was amiss. My tent, flashlight, and sleeping bag were all in their respective places. Radiation sickness would take much longer than a day to make me that sick. Whatever I saw that night was real. I don't know if it's military weapon testing, or the military protecting whatever is in that reactor, but now I know why the citizens of Pripyat never returned home. I don't really know where to begin. Since last December, I've been traveling all over the continent with my husband, John. We got married in November 2021, and we decided to set off on a year-long adventure. We started in London, and by November of this year, we found ourselves staying in a beautiful, isolated villa near the town of Larvik in Norway. We wanted to explore Bolkeskogen, the beech tree forest, but I was already unsettled by the time we reached Norway. For a few months, I'd been certain that a man was following us. He'd probably been on our tail since London, but it was only when we reached Berlin that I became acutely aware of him. He was standing in the street, watching as I drew the curtains closed. John and I were staying on the first floor, and the man was standing on the pavement in front of our hotel. This haunting silhouette seemed frighteningly familiar. I could scarcely see his face as he concealed it beneath a hood, but his green parka was so vivid that it sent a cold wave rushing through my body. I should have noticed him sooner. I'd seen him before. In Barcelona, he had been on the walking tour with us. I remember thinking that it had seemed far too warm for such a bulky parka in the middle of March, so he had certainly made an impression on me. Had I seen him in London too? Paris? Rome? Perhaps. You're scaring me, Louise, John said. Yeah, well, it's scary. Who is he? I asked. Probably someone completely different, John replied, but his voice seemed unsteady. It's him, John. I think I saw him in Belgium too, in that pub, the terrible one. The one with the beer? He asked. Yeah, I remember seeing a man wearing that exact green parka. I know I did. I was pissed out of my head, but I saw it. Well, that resolved the matter in John's mind. I had been far too drunk for any account of that evening to be trustworthy. To him, the case was closed. I would have loved to sweep it under the rug, but I couldn't. So there I sat. John was sleeping, preparing himself for a full day of hiking through Bokeskogen. Me? I was sitting in front of the living room window. The beech tree forest lay beyond the glass. The next day, John insisted on exploring. He was comfortably certain that I was merely drawing dots between a sequence of coincidences. You want to see a green parka everywhere, so you're seeing a green parka everywhere, John said, leaning in to give me a kiss before we stepped onto the porch of our villa. It's confirmation bias. I suppose so, but that man in Berlin was watching me. Well, he was probably a creep, but we're not in Berlin now, are we? We're in Norway, and that man isn't here. John skipped along merrily, and I begrudgingly plodded behind him. The sun set somewhere around 3.45 p.m. I lit the way with my torch, and my eyes were darting between my watch and the footpath as we speed walked back to our lonely little villa. Well, I was speed walking. John was huffing and puffing behind me. Will you slow down? He panted. You stopped for 20 minutes to take photos. I told you we needed to head back, I snapped. Relax, Luis. We're what? 30 minutes away? John replied. More like 40, I sighed. That's when I heard it, the snapping of a twig. I stopped in my tracks, but John trudged forwards, obviously. Shh, stop, I hissed. What? I thought you wanted to get back, he groaned. I heard something. John stopped. I turned around, frantically trying to find the source of the snapping sound. I cast a torchlight in John's direction, and he shielded his eyes. Nothing. I slowly moved the light across the tree line, trying not to focus on the fact that my heart was hammering my ribcage. It was probably just an animal, John said. It wasn't an animal, I screeched as quietly as possible. There was a much louder snap this time, followed by the noisy rustling of shrubbery. I cast the light in the direction of the second disturbance, 
and that's when I caught the brief glimpse of something horrifying. A green shape vanished beyond the reach of my light, and bushes shook behind it. Did you see that? I asked, sweat drenching my face. Yes, John spat, barging past me. It was an animal. Come on, I want to get back. As we walked, I listened attentively. The forest was quiet. Actually, it was silent. We got back to the villa around 4.20 p.m. Not late. Not at all. But it felt late. It was pitch black outside. No sign of civilization. Nothing. John twisted the key in the door, stepped inside, and turned off the main lights in the open living area. I shut the front door behind us and hurriedly locked it. I'm going to bed, John grumbled, stomping up the staircase to the bedroom. I'm just going to stay out here a while, I replied, gulping. I stood in the living room and stared out of the window. Then the motion sensor light came on. There, standing in the middle of the clearing between our villa and the tree line, was the man in the green parka. I froze. The man and I must have locked eyes for no more than ten seconds, but it felt like an eternity. Detecting no more motion, the light turned off. The sound of shattering glass followed, as did scattering footsteps. The hooded man had hurled something at the light to break it. Luis? John appeared at the top of the stairs. Stay there, John, I warned. What was that sound? Did you break something? He asked. Do not come downstairs. I would have said more, but I was interrupted by the sound of knocking on the front door. What the? Who's that? We're in the middle of nowhere, John bellowed. Do not come downstairs, I repeated. He didn't listen. He raced downstairs, but I didn't trust John in a crisis. I yanked the door open, and John gasped, gasped as he realized I had been right all along. The man in the green parka. Oh, God. Call the police! I screamed, refusing to peel my eyes away from the menacing figure in the doorway. J John? I whimpered, maintaining eye contact with the man at the door. John did not reply. My name is Peter Blake, the man said. Leave me alone, I wept. My daughter, Abigail, she died here five years ago, the man explained, ignoring my incessant crying. This is where it always ends. This is where the victims disappear, never to be seen again. Please, I begged. I wasn't following you to hurt you. I had to warn you. I'm trying to save you, Peter said. Save me from what? Louise asked. It happened so quickly. There was John. He'd slipped out the back of the treehouse. He stood at Peter's side, plunging the knife into the side of the stranger's skull. Then, he let the hooded man's body crumple to the ground. But all I really remember is that smile. That awful smile. From me, John answered. I screamed and sprinted into the kitchen, slinking through the open back door. I started to run towards the forest. I figured that my safest bet was to hide somewhere deep in the forest until morning. Then I could get my bearings. Realizing I left the torch at the house, I pulled out my phone and used it to light the way. Over the sound of my rapidly beating heart and the grass crunching beneath my feet, I heard laughter. Louise, John sweetly called from somewhere behind me in the darkness. He sounded almost inhuman. Gone was the man I'd married. I started to feel nauseated as I realized I'd been sharing my life with a monster. I tried to hold back tears and vomit as adrenaline fueled me onwards. I delved deeper and deeper into the dense forest, too afraid to find the footpath and make myself an easy target. I was shakily dialing 113 Norway's emergency number. The conversation with the operator is hazy in my memory, but thankfully he spoke English. I gave him the address of the villa, and he told me that it would take half an hour for the dispatch police officers to reach the house. I turned off my phone light. I didn't want to advertise my location to him. I remember thinking that maybe I could stay deathly quiet and wait for the police to scare John away. Thirty minutes, at the very least, before they even started to search the forest. It was too long. I lay there and waited. I don't know how much time passed. And then I saw it. Not what I had expected to see. The green parka. John was wearing it. In the dim light of his own phone torch, I could make out red smears on the coat. I love it here. So quiet. So peaceful. I'm furious that Peter disturbed our precious time together. But he's gone now. It's over, darling. Let's go back to the house. My hand was clasped over my mouth and tears were rolling down my cheeks. John looked around, surveying the area with his phone light. 
He must have been no more than 30 yards away from me. Fortunately, my little den was far too dense and overgrown for my body to be visible, but I could sense John's temperament changing. You think I want to be out here in this cold forest? I'm getting bored now, Luis. Come out, and we could pretend none of this ever happened. He was on the verge of leaving, and then my phone rang. It was my mom. I was supposed to call her that evening. If only she'd waited, just waited until the morning. I still hear John's victorious <laughs> laugh in my dreams, a blood-curdling sound, like an animal that had finally caught its prey. Do I see you in there, Luis? That looks cozy. Mind if I join? I scrambled out of the den and started running. I left my phone, I know, don't even say it. If you've ever been in a life or death situation, you should know that rational thought leaves your brain. I knew my best chance was to loop back to the house and hide somewhere until the police came. After 10 minutes of bumping into trees and nearly tripping on branches, I saw the distant lights of a house. The villa. I was almost there, but then everything fell silent around me. I froze. There was the sound of crunching leaves right behind me. Hello, darling. John whispered in my left ear. I felt that pain twice as John then wrenched the knife from my body and pushed me to the ground. You were my favorite. I hope that gives you comfort. You really impressed me, John said. But Peter was right. Everything ends here. This is where I come to reset. Wait! I cried, stalling for time. Don't you want to know? I rolled over onto my back, crying out in pain and gazing up at the green parka that hovered above me. John tilted his head to one side, seemingly curious. I have a secret too, I whispered. Oh, and what might you be hiding, Louise? I'm like you, and you're not my first either, I replied. You are not like me, Louise. I groaned, making up my speech as I went along. Do you think I cared about that stalker? Given the chance, I would have killed him myself. That's why I answered the door before you. I was trying to protect you. I always thought you were like me. That's what drew me to you. John paused. I could almost hear the cogs whirring in his head. I was certain he saw through my lie, but that didn't matter. All I had to do was entertain him a little longer. If I could keep him interested, I could stay alive. That was my logic. I don't believe you, he said finally. Okay, I just couldn't die without letting you know, I responded, clutching feverishly to both the lie and my last strand of life. This... no, shut up, Luis. What game are you playing? This isn't part of the... You're not playing your part, John scowled. He was furious. It doesn't matter either way. <sighs> he sighed. If you were like me, you'd understand that I have to do this. Sirens. Hallelujah, I thought. I blinked and the man in the green parka was gone. After months of being followed, it felt strange to finally be free. No eyes on me at long last. All I could see was the night sky, a cold chasm of darkness above me. Over here? I screamed hoarsely into the night. I screamed that over and over again until the police officers found me. I don't really remember anything else from that night, but I woke up at a Norwegian hospital. My parents and my brother flew out to be with me. Obviously, they were just happy I was alive, but I couldn't stop thinking about John. The police still haven't found him. I'm back in England now. For months, I haven't been able to get my psychopathic ex-husband out of my mind. I keep jumping at the side of my own shadow. I moved away from London, obviously, but I still feel him out there. Last night I was drawing my curtain, and I swear I saw a flash of something green disappear into an alley at the other side of the street. This all started because of a Little League game. My youngest, Landon, has a game every Thursday, and for the longest time, I have been putting off being present. When I did go, I decided to be the best single dad I could be and snap pictures of every single hit and run that they did. Once I got permission from the coach and we went for ice cream, I shared Landon's game pics all across Instagram and Facebook. I used as many hashtags as I could. I guess I was overcompensating for the fact that ever since his mom and I have gotten the divorce, I just haven't had the time for him or for his older brother Tim. Work has had to come first, and usually that was to pay the sitter. Anyway, I shared his photos across a large web of social media accounts showing off how proud I was. The next day, I started noticing I was getting a lot of requests from people that were either from his school or friends of friends, and I just accepted them all. I figured there wouldn't be any harm. But that night, I got an email that changed everything. It came almost an hour after Tim and Landon fell asleep. I was in my room doing some work stuff when the message appeared on my lower computer screen. 
The caption read, Cute kid. And it came from a scrambled dummy email account. Curiously, I clicked on it and read the rest of the message, my heart beating a little faster as I went down the line of text. I was browsing through my usual hunting grounds when I came across your pictures. Your children remind me so much of my darling Avery. She was my first. Now with your pictures a tap away, she won't be my last. I immediately deleted it and tried to not shudder. Still, I thought that would be the end of it. I went to the social media platforms that I had placed their pictures on and took them down, worried that some other sicko might be out there. It wasn't enough. By morning, I had received several new emails, each from a different burner account, and all of them from the stalker. They had decided to take things to the next level. Each email had attached a picture of Landon or his little league team along with a warning of what was to come. I thought you should be aware that I decided to keep copies of all those lovely pictures you posted so freely, smiley face. If you want to see what I'm doing with them, click the link below. I couldn't resist. I needed to know what this was. The link took me to a website that alerted my typical Fireware software that I was leaving the security of the mainstream web. The dark web, I thought with a sickening feeling. The pictures were all neatly arranged with price tags alongside them. Then I got another email from the Predator. Sharing is caring, but if you share this with the police, I can guarantee a lot worse is going to happen. I dared to reply to them, to find out what their end game was. I will give you anything you want, just don't hurt me or my children, I typed out. I got an almost instant reply. And where's the fun in that? My body felt numb. A worse feeling wiggling its way into my heart as I realized that this pervert wasn't in it for money. This isn't a game. This is my family, I type back. For now, you mean? You're bluffing. I'm going to go to the police and they will mail your ass to the wall, I replied. Try me, my boy, smiley face. I didn't know what to do. I shut down the computer and called my father. During the divorce, he had helped me handle some of the legal intricacies and had always been on my side. Even as I was explaining the situation, he kept telling me to slow down. You're not making any sense. Why would anyone do this? What do they get out of it? He asked. I didn't know, and that scared me to death. Then he offered me some sound advice. Just ignore them, Jack. They can't hurt you if you take away their connection to you, he insisted. It sounded like a good idea. I told him thank you and tried to get some sleep, but the Predator had other plans. Just as I was fully in dreamland, my phone buzzed. A dozen more emails. I clicked on all of them to mark them as spam and tried to lay back down. I even made sure Landon and Tim were fine, just because the disturbing messages were making me paranoid. Then another email made me stop dead in my tracks. Sleep well, smiley face, the caption read. I opened it and found that I was watching a video of myself walking into my boys' room and tucking them into bed. I looked up at my home security system and screamed in fury. Just leave us alone! Leave my family alone! I demanded. I went to the closet and grabbed a baseball bat from Landon. I wasn't about to let this pervert or his friends watch my children sleep or anything else. I smashed the cameras around my house to bits one by one. Landon got up, hearing the noise and noticing how frightened I was. Dad? What's wrong? He asked sleepily. Get back in bed! I ordered him as the phone pinged again. Bad move, Jack. If you take away my access to them, you're gonna regret it. This time I was on the offensive. I'm not letting you see anything about them ever again, and I will go to the police first thing in the morning. Their reply was unexpected. Why wait? Let's call them now, smiley face. I couldn't help to text back a confused response. What? What do you mean? Landon kept tugging at me as I reconnected to their sicko website automatically. Had they hacked into my phone? Did you forget what got into your computer hard drive? Now I don't know about you, but it looks pretty bad to have all these pics of other people's kids for sale, Jack, the message said. I knew what was happening and I felt powerless to stop it. This was blackmail, a power play. They had linked all their twisted messages directly to my computer, making the connection to them untraceable. I couldn't help but to break down in tears. I just want this to stop. Make it stop. Send me more pictures and we can keep this between us. No one has to know. 
the predator had complete control over me. I did as they requested, but even as I did, forced to send pictures of my own innocent sleeping children to some evil stranger, I started to plan ahead. I needed to leave, to restart my life. Everything I knew would need to be left behind. Change our names, our numbers, everything. It was the only way or I would be their pawn forever. I swallowed a gulp of air and sent it to the website. Then I smashed my phone to bits. I went to the back laundry room and cut off the power to the house, waking up Landon and Tim as I did. Dad, it's the middle of the night. Where are we going? They asked as I got them dressed. Put your shoes on. We have to leave, I told them. They were half asleep and didn't question me. We got into the car and I started to drive. I recently moved into a new apartment with my dog, Marvels. It's not a nice place by any means, but it's the only option I had. I'm just starting a new job and I barely have enough money to cover rent, ramen, dog food, and a Netflix subscription. So I settled on this small dirt jeep apartment on the outskirts of town, partly because it's cheap and partly because it's pet friendly. No, it isn't ideal, but it's only temporary while I save up some cash. The apartment is small with only three rooms. The first room you enter is the kitchen slash living room with a hallway in the back. The door at the end of the hall leads to the bathroom. In the hallway is a door on the right side of the bedroom. I don't have any furnishings or personal belongings, so the apartment remained very bare. I never bothered to worry about sprucing the place up because it was just a temporary home. We had been in the apartment for a few weeks and everything had been fine. As we really settled into the place, Marvels took a liking to the couch in the living room. It wasn't my couch, it came with the apartment. Well, Marvels started sleeping on the couch at night. That said, Marvels likes to get up and relocate in the middle of the night. She would get up and come to the bedroom door and hope to get inside. I always sleep with the door closed, so she would start to whine and paw at the door. Marvels had long nails that she hated getting cut, so you could hear her walking throughout the apartment if you were awake and it made her pawing pretty loud. After a few nights of this, I just started leaving the door open for her. From then on, she would come and get in the bed with me at all times of the night. This never bothered me. Many more weeks went by with nothing noteworthy happening. Well, one weekend, my Netflix binging session lasted much longer than usual and I was still up at 2 in the morning. I was just wrapping up Stranger Things Season 2 when out of the corner of my eye, I saw it. In the doorway to the hall, there was something peeking at me. I turned to look directly at it. It looked like the top half of a face peeking from the left side of the doorway. The only thing I could see were two eyes, beady and black, staring at me. I was frozen, not sure if it was fear or shock stopping me from moving. I blinked. It was still there. After a few more seconds, I started panicking and yelled out, Who are you? Get out! For a few more seconds, it kept staring and then slowly began to pull away and out of view. Once I could no longer see it, it took a few moments to regain control of my body. Once I had, I jumped up and slammed the door, locking it. Marvels, who had been laying on the bed with me, was now sitting up and alert. I called the police and told them that someone had broken into my apartment. After a while, I heard them knocking on the front door. Eventually, I mustered the courage to step out from the room and run to the front door. They investigated and the landlord was called. No one was found in the apartment. And when the police had arrived, the front door was still locked from when I got home. There were no signs of breaking and entering, but I insisted that I saw someone. The police did one more sweep of the apartment before leaving, telling me that there was nothing more they could do. The landlord, to whom I must give credit, swapped out the locks the next day, giving me all new keys. He told me that it was possible a previous tenant still had a set of keys to the room and had come in. The thought unnerved me, but the more I thought back on it, the less human the thing seemed to be. It took a few weeks and many sleepless nights to go back to normal, if you could call it that. I told myself that I could handle the stress, that we would only be here a little while longer. During that time, I also bought a baseball bat, which I now kept beside my bed. Now, I still kept the door to the bedroom open at night, but only slightly ajar so marbles could slip in or out. I didn't feel comfortable seeing the doorway where that thing had been. One night, marbles came in and hopped up on the bed like she usually does. She settled down and rested her head on my thigh, a common occurrence. I had been asleep and never bothered to open my eyes. I started drifting back off to sleep when I heard a sound. It was a familiar sound of scratching on the floor. It was Marvel's nails on the floor as she walked. 
It came from the living room and was approaching the bedroom door. I was facing the side of the room with the door and I opened my eyes. Marbles was there, pushing the door open and coming in. A chill ran up my spine. Slowly, I looked over and down at the bed. It was there. The thing was resting its head on my thigh, looking right into my eyes. For a second, I got a look at it. It had a humanoid form, but it was impossibly inhuman. Its face was horrific with those beady black eyes, long greasy black hair, and a mouth without lips. Its body was elongated, and it looked as though it was made up of only bones with skin wrapped tightly around them. Its face started to creep closer to mine and I was finally able to move. I threw the blanket over the thing and jumped out of the bed, running to the front door. I could hear it scurrying behind me, along with marbles running behind. When I got to the door, I turned to see both marbles and the thing following. Marbles made it to the door first, and once she was out, I slammed the door closed. I heard and felt the thing slam against the door, scratching and banging against it. I could also hear its raspy breathing. Eventually, it all went quiet. My phone was still inside, but after a while, one of the neighbors opened the door after frantic knocking. They phoned the police for me. The police weren't as friendly this time, but I told them I trapped the person inside my apartment. After a long search of the entire apartment, the police found nothing. I couldn't believe it. They scolded me and told me that if I called for this again, I'd be arrested. I felt like I was going insane. Refusing to go back in alone, the landlord accompanied me while I packed up all my belongings. I wasn't staying here any longer. My parents had an extra room they offered me, and it was going to take a long time before I felt comfortable being alone again. I'm typing this all out from my parents' house, laying in the guest room. Well, a few paragraphs ago, I noticed something. Over in the corner is a closet with folding doors. It's slightly open, and in the crack of the doors, I can see two beady black eyes staring right at me. A Graveyard Built of Memories 2009 Six of us stood around a shallow grave with shovels in hand, exhausted from the dig as fresh frost fell over top us. The air smelled of dirt and sweat. If anyone had told me this would be how I would start my senior spring break, I probably would have laughed in their face. I was supposed to be on a road trip with my sister a thousand miles away. Instead, I was burying her in the woods alongside five strangers who claimed to be her friend. She died in a hit and run the week before, her perfect life shattered in an instant. It said something about the irony of life, but I couldn't tell you what. I wasn't there when they found her body, thank God but I did hear that she lived for 19 minutes while paramedics tried to pry her from the twisted metal of the car. A few days later, my parents agreed to cremation, a quiet ceremony and to disperse her belongings to anyone who wanted them. This was how we found the time capsule. Wrapped up in a burlap sack like a picnic basket, the small cylindrical metal object sat in the trunk of her Ford Focus like a treasure chest waiting to be unlocked. A few of her college notebooks told me that she had been keeping it for a friend, but that she also intended to bury it in the Carrington Woods Cemetery as a memento to her own childhood. Dad said it would be a good idea to fulfill that wish and to put her ashes in the ground alongside the capsule. I remember logging onto MySpace and shooting a message to a few of her friends, telling them my intentions. I figured since a lot of them hadn't shown up for the funeral, this secluded meadow with a few nameless tombstones would be a better setting. No need to dress up. Just come and remember my big sister Cassie. The ones that did come didn't say much, but they each brought a few items to put inside the capsule. Photographs, letters, jewelry, the kinds of things you might place near a memorial. I didn't ask what they were. I don't even remember asking who most of them were. It didn't matter at that moment. Nothing mattered. I kept thinking. My sister was gone, and that whatever was left of her was now meant to be a part of history, buried forever or for the next generation to dig up. I think I promised I would keep in touch with the people who came. They mimicked the sentiment, then we went our separate ways, fully aware that we would never do so. I remember thinking that I felt guilty for not putting anything of my own inside the capsule. But Dad told me I was wrong about that. Cassie is in there. She's a bigger part of you than any trinket would have been. Present day, tragedy infects memory. It starts small, 
A few people open doors for you or give you a discount at the store as a token of respect. They think one act of goodwill can undo all the pain you're experiencing. They mean well, of course. No one intends to put you on display or treat you different. It just happens. Suddenly, this is what they associate you with. The only part of your life that matters anymore. It's as if time stops when bad things happen and you're paralyzed. The only way to move on is to forget the tragedy yourself. It's a necessity to survive. I didn't want to forget Cassie and what she meant to me. But gradually, that is exactly what happened. I moved away, got married, and had a life of my own. It was a tragedy that brought me back to her. I was coming home for the holidays, Thanksgiving break, but instead my turkey day was spent answering questions for the police, trying to hold it together. When I came up their driveway, I could tell something was wrong. Dad and Mom had said they were going to be waiting up for me despite the late hour. Instead, there wasn't a single Christmas light on, the power was off, and not even a single dog was barking. Stepping out toward the door in the cold, I had a premonition. You know when you can just tell that things aren't right? I knew before I stepped into the house what I was going to find, and yet I had to go check. To see for myself if the vision was true. A few moments later, the dark fantasy in my head played out in reality when I saw my mom's body lying on the living room carpet with bullet holes in her back. The entire den was a mess, everything taken from the flat screen to the coffee table ornaments. I could see from the blood and chaos that Dad had tried to put up a fight before he fled. And wandering into the next room, he told me that it had been worth it. One of the thieves was there dead as well, having bled out from an impact to the skull. I remember telling the police that I didn't know why anyone would do this. My parents go to church regularly. They help out at the homeless shelter. They are good people. No one seemed to know where dad was at and the police theorized that the robbers were holding him hostage now. It was some time during the questioning that one of the cops said something that caught my attention. They had moved the body of the thief and come across, as the officer put it, something peculiar. When we went to examine it, I knew immediately what it was. Cassie's time capsule. To see it unearthed was unusual already. No one besides four or five people even knew where it was buried. But to see that it had been dug up by burglars had me asking a dozen questions. Was there something inside the capsule that they wanted to steal? How did they know it was there? What did Cassie and everyone else put inside of it? I asked the officers if I could hold on to it and they didn't see a problem with it. That was about two days ago. Dad still hasn't been found. The capsule arrived today and I think it took all of my willpower to open it up. The police told me that it was rightfully mine since no one else in my family was alive to take it. And it occurred to me that this little object was responsible for so much bloodshed. I pried it open with anger, tossing out the items onto my bed. None of it seemed to matter, not at first. There was jewelry I knew that her old flames had given her from ages ago. Pictures of time she spent with her friends going to the nearby woods to camp. She loved those woods, I thought as I focused on a picture. The date read 2013. It made me freeze as I realized the photograph had to be a mistake. Cassie had died in 2009. Who was putting things in the time capsule after her death and also making it seem like it was her? Then I saw newspaper clippings, strange headlines that made me feel an uneasy sense of dread. Killings near Carrington Woods remain unsolved. Two boys go missing at Carrington Cemetery. Graves with unidentified bodies puzzle authorities. Ownership of Carrington Cemetery remains in question. I didn't know what any of it could mean, but the next batch of items told me this was something deadly serious. Photographs of my father in the woods digging those graves. Was Cassie monitoring them? I saw notes that were written to my mother and I realized that they had been having correspondence with each other after Cassie had faked her death. I reached for a notebook that had my name on it. Sometimes she would do that just to confuse me and then tattle to mom or dad that I read her diary. I recognized her handwriting immediately. Paul, you have questions. The cemetery will offer answers. Come find the truth. Cass. Just reading those words made me shake with anticipation. Was my sister really alive? How could it be possible that she had remained hidden all of these years, and more importantly, why? I went to the woods as soon as I could. I told my wife it wouldn't take long. The empty meadow felt haunting. I found Cassie's grave easily because it had been dug up. And then I noticed other graves had also been dug up too. Don't move, 
a voice whispered from the trees. A woman I hardly recognized came out of the woods. Cassie. She was covered in camouflage and holding a camera. Then I heard the discharge of a gun. Behind me, a large body fell into the newly dug grave. Dad had followed me and was about to attack us both. Cassie stepped toward me, her hands shaking as she dropped the pistol. It's taken me almost 20 years to prove our father was a serial killer, Paul. Once he realized that I had been using this capsule to hide evidence, she looked toward the road and seemed sad. Mom paid the price for not being careful. And all those years ago, Dad thought you were gone. You've been here this whole time. I realized as we hugged. I had questions of my own that shook me to my very core, but none of it seemed to matter as we melted into each other's arms. I lost so much when I lost her. I wasn't sure I would get it back now, or it would be lost in this graveyard alongside all these other memories. But maybe we can make new ones.